Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study, our book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the Greek word meaning repetition of the, uh, repeating the law, or um, you could say, um, uh, some people would say a second law. It's repeating the law, and it's repeating it by who? By Moses. Okay. It's the fifth book in the Pentateuch. Okay. And Five being grace, of course, and the way Moses puts forth the law, you know, he was not a legalist like a, a big attorney from downtown. He explained things in a country way where both, most anyone could understand it. So that's what makes, that's what makes the, this book, Deuteronomy, outstanding, is that it's put forth in a way that simplifies um, the very word itself. I think it's important that you know the Hebrew name. It's Elehadabrim, Barim, which is to say it's the first three words of the first verse. These words, okay. It's the word of God, okay. Elehadabrim, and uh, specifically these words, the words of God. Now, I think it's important also that some people are confused about who the author was, which is, which is ridiculous, okay? Because Jesus in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan, when he would say, it is written, he quoted three times from the book of Deuteronomy. You want me to say that again? In the wilderness when Jesus was tempted by Satan himself, he, repeat, he repeated, it is written, and he was quoting Deuteronomy. And as far as the author is concerned, it's nailed in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8, by the teachings of Christ in relationship to quoting Deuteronomy 24, 1. I want to say that again because if you ever have any doubts about the author, it's Christ himself giving you the credentials. I'll say it again. Matthew 19, verse 8, Christ identifies Moses as the author of Deuteronomy, quoting Deuteronomy 24, 1. Okay. So, having said that, let's get right into it. As we're about, we'll open up about 37 years into the captivity. I, I would not, I believe that Moses will, his, his surmise will come to pass about two months after this book is finished, a month or two months. And it's at the end of the wandering in the wilderness. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name it reads, These be the words, and that be the title in the Hebrew, which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain of Arabah, over against the Red Sea, the red reeds properly, between Paran and Tophel, and Laban, and Hazeroth, and Dizahab. In other words, this points to about 37 years of wandering in the wilderness, okay? When that generation must pass away. Verse two, there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir, unto Kadesh Barnea. You know, this is where, uh, you need to understand this Hebrew name, okay? Kadesh is holy, and Barnea is wandering in the wilderness. So the holy wandering in the desert, okay? The desert of wandering, more properly stated. This is where they waited one day too late. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. Salvation is always open, but there will come a time when it will be one day too late. So you need to really understand and know that our, our Father 
is in control. Our Father has a set of rules, and this happens to be the words. And when it is that day, one day too late, he, he did away with an entire generation being stubborn. Verse 3, And it came to pass in the 40th year, 40th probation, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all that the Lord had given him in commandments unto them. Uh, this, again, this would take place in about one of his last months. Okay. Verse 4. After he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Olk, the king of Bashan, uh, which dwelt at Ashtaroth in Edria. And um, Yah gave him the victory there. God was with them. And God gave Moses that victory, absolute. When you go out with God, you're going to win. When you don't go with God, you're going to lose, period. Okay. Verse 5. On this side, Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, saying, verse 6, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, that's Sinai, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. In other words, it's, you've wandered in this wilderness about long enough. Okay, And God had taken care of them while they were there. Verse 7, Turn ye, and take your journey, and go to the mount of the Amorites, and into all the place nigh thereunto, in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, again, I, I want, lest I confuse someone, He's relating the 70, 37 years of history. This is when they first came out. 37 years have passed, okay, since the time that God told them, get over there and take the promised land. Now, what you want to remember, and we're about to enter the promised land, okay. We're coming to that generation, the, par the generation of the fig tree, which they will, in fact, enter the promised land, which is to say the millennium, the millennium age. And this is a likeness or in preparation thereto, so to speak. So think of that as we read these scriptures. Make sure you don't make the same mistakes some of these people did. Verse 8, Euphrates always being the boundary between Israel and Babylon. That's to say confusion. Have you crossed over? Have you come out of confusion? Do you understand the truth? The truth will set you free. Verse 8, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. Verse 9, And I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. In other words, we're going to appoint some judges here. I don't have, you know, the, the Israel was blossoming. They were multiplying. And that was God's promise. And that is nothing to the promise he has made to this day that Israel would, would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and sands of the sea. Verse 10, The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. Verse 11, listen carefully. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as you are and bless you as he hath promised you. In other words, it was God's promise. It was God's covenant. And many people reading this say, well, th this Bible is written to Israel. And they, they don't even know who Israel is. They do not know that in God's word, he separated the house of Judah and the house of Israel. 
The house of Israel was taken captive 200 years before the house of Judah was by the Assyrian taken over the Caucasian, Caucasus Mount, Caucasus Mountains and were later called Caucasians, which settling Europe, many of them later migrating to the Americas, Canada, and there you have the true house of Israel. The house of Judah, still the same. Pretty well everybody knows the house of Judah and even some of the Kenites claim to be of that house and they are not. But they have multiplied. That promise of God came to pass. Verse 12. In other words, the Bible is written to many that are truly of the house of Israel, the ten tribes that went north, and they don't even know it. Verse 12. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance, that's to say your trouble, Taurus, and your burden and your strife? Well, well he couldn't because of so many. And, and give it a fair hearing, okay? Verse 13, take ye wise men and, un, and understanding and no one among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. In other words, we're going to appoint some uh, judges that are qualified and that will care for the people, not for themselves. Those, those rules will be laid down here. Verse 14, and ye answered me and said, the thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. Uh, we, want, we want to go along with that. It was order, okay. Verse 15, so I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and no one, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands and captains over hundreds and captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officer, officers among your tribes. In other words, order was given, order was kept. 16, and I charged your judges, listen carefully, I charged your judges at that time saying, hear the cause between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with him. Always be righteous and judge righteous. That's the only way you can be a judge. A judge must have the gift of setting himself aside and using his wisdom and that that is fair in, in judging between uh, two brethren. Okay. And seeing that 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 is right, that's what righteousness is, is doing what's right, is kept at the forefront. That way you have peace among the people. But you let one judge show favoritism and, or begin to take bribes, and God hates that. Oh, how he hates that. Whether it be a favor for a friend or what, that then you have bad judgment and you have a government that is foul and uh, no good. And certainly God is against that sort of thing. And even to this day, that's the way judges should be. Verse 17, you shall not respect persons in judgment. You're gonna, not gonna show any favoritism, but you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid of the face of man. For the judgment is God's. That's the reason. The judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it into me, for I will hear it. I will hear it. And what he's saying is God will be the one that make the judgment. Why? Because he would do it by these words, which is to say this book of Deuteronomy, which is to say the law. And as we go through this law, maybe a little better understanding will come between that that is law, that that is statutes, that that is ordinances. For the law never changes, but statutes and ordinances can be fulfilled in other ways whereby they do, as a matter of fact, Christ became many things among the rituals and ordinances. Verse 18. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. I mean, coming out the gate, 
when we broke loose from uh, Egypt, I laid all these things out and it was our plan. Verse 19, and when we departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness, which you saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. That is to say, Kadesh is holy, Barnea, the desert of wandering. We came to that point in history where the decision was to be made. One day too late for many, my friend. Listen carefully and learn from the very Word of God. Okay. Verse 20, And I said unto you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. It's ours. It's His promise. 21, Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Now, you know, you know what is a strange thing? There are going to be murmurings and fear mongerings, eyes parting from the Word of God, there's going to be rumors, there's giants over there. They will brutalize us. They, God's already said, I give it to you. I've cleansed it. And he did. Okay. It was prepared for them. But these rumors kept saying, It'll, it's going to be brutal. It's a land, there's giants over there. You know, when, when, just when you cross over from Kadesh Barnea, there is a long, jagged back little mountain called the Giant's Backbone. I think this is where the, many of the stories got started. That's just my opinion and um, uh, it, for what it's worth. But people pick up on rumors real easy and fear mongers are rampant. They were at this time. When God said, go in, I'm with you. Next verse, please. Verse 22. And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, we will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. Now, you know, if you're moving that many people, women and children, not a bad idea to send scouts out, but that's not the reason these people were sending these men out. They, they've turned into, I mean, God has hand-fed them for all this time, and they've actually turned themselves into a bunch of wimps. They're afraid. 23, and the saying pleased me well, Moses says, and I took 12 men of you, one of a tribe. I picked one from each of the 12 tribes. 24, and they turned out, and they turned and went up into the mountain and came into the valley of Ethkal. That's the cluster of grapes. I mean, it was so fertile, the grapes were just, they were huge, falling off the vine there for, just for the taking and searched it out. What prepared for them, a land of plenty. Okay. 25, and they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and, and said, it is good land which the Lord our God doth give us. It's running over with fruit. 26, notwithstanding, ye would not go up but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. This is trouble, my friend. When God gives you an opening and a promise, you want to be ready to take it. You know, even as we're about ready to enter the promised land here in the end times, the millennium age, the nearing of the time that the false Messiah will appear, when God depends on you, then you, you, you sure don't want to wimp out why? Because God has his hand on you. He's going to take care of you. You've got nothing to worry about when God is with you. 
verse 27, and you murmured or rebelled in your tents, wouldn't come out and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. That means to, to um, absolutely ex exterminate us is what the word is in the Hebrew. Now, now stop and think for a moment. Really stop and think. How can they possibly say God hated them? He parted the Red Sea and they crossed over on dry ground. He flooded Sephira's army, drowned them, protecting his own. He gave them a cloud in the daytime to shadow them in the desert. And at night, he gave them a pillar of fire to protect them. And they're saying God hated them? You see how far the truth can be twisted if you listen to a bunch of wimps that are too afraid to even come out of a tent. So, you know, a coward dies a thousand deaths. A brave man dies once. Okay. But it is true. A bunch of cowards, you cannot trust them. Wimps, you can't do anything with them. You have to pe have people that are focused, trained, disciplined, and march to the tune of the drummer. That is to say, Almighty God. When God says go, go. And here they're making up a bunch of stuff that uh, God said, I've cleared the land for you. <laughs> There's people over there going to exterminate us. It's a lie. 28. Whither shall we go up? Question. Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, the people is greater and taller than we. They're giants. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. That's, that's long-necked is what it means, the sons of Anak, okay. They're a giant. Okay. They're, they're just a bunch of wimps, okay. All that God has done for them I hope you can let this be an example to know when God strengthens you, when God uses you, don't you ever let something cause you to wimp out when he's prepared the way for you. He's kicked the big rocks out of the road. He will never leave anything that you can't handle yourself. Just do it, okay? Be a doer, a can-do type person, <clears throat> never a wimp especially when God makes it so obvious that he takes care of his own. Verse 29, then I said unto you, dread not, neither be afraid of them. Verse 30, the Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. You witnessed it. You observed it, <clears throat> 31, and in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that you went until you came into this place. He has protected you, showered you, cuddled you, cared for you, and here you turn out to be a bunch of wimps. 32, yet in this thing, you did not believe the Lord your God. You're just not a believer. 33, who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, in the fire by night, to show you by uh, what way you should go, and in a cloud by the day. Boy, he comforted you every foot of the way. <clears throat> 34, and the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear saying, you know, listen, you, you can just really disappoint God to a point that he'll say something like this, 35, surely 
There shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. I got it laid out out there. It's, the fruit is just running over the borders. And you won't go in because of murmuring and disbelieving me. You can understand how our father, I mean, he, he cuddled them, protected them, took care of Pharaoh's army. I mean, and they were well armed. These people had nothing but God, and that's sufficient. Okay, That makes the majority. 36, save Caleb. And Caleb was all right. He, he, um, Caleb means capable, and boy was he. The son of, of uh, Jephun, and, uh, Jephunai, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. He was, he was gung-ho. He was ready to go. 37, also, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou shalt also not go in thither. And as it is written in Numbers chapter 20, verses 11 and 12, Moses with the people, this murmuring and backbiting going on. They were thirsty and the rock was there. The rock that is symbolic of our rock, Christ, the living water from which the living water flowed and Moses struck that rock not once, but he struck it twice. That's like crucifying Christ all over again. God won't have that. Okay. And this is a price that Moses himself will pay for striking that rock. Uh, again, as it is uh, written in Numbers chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. Now, when we come to the final chapter of this great book of Deuteronomy, I think you will see that God still loved uh, this Moses and he took good care of him. Verse 38, <clears throat> but Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Now, Joshua would, would become their leader. To, and as you well know, Joshua being interpreted in the Hebrew language is Yeshua, okay? And many of you recognize that as the name Jesus. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the New Testament, in one place that I can think of at least once, Joshua's name is translated Jesus, and it makes it very confusing if you're not familiar with languages. Uh, and in a sense, he is that savior that takes them into the promised land. That is to say, a type. So um, bearing that in mind, uh, Moses not leaving them, but knowing, did he question God? Well, God, will you forgive me and let me enter that promised land after all this fight and struggle with these people? Let not, he, he did not. He would never um, uh, argue with our father to that point. I mean, the sentence was passed. He accepted it, period. Okay, one more verse, uh, verse uh, 39. Moreover, your little ones, which you said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day have no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. I'm going to bless them. Those that were too young to even make a decision, I'm going to give them that new land that you refuse to enter because you're a bunch of wimps. Okay. You're just murmuring, complaining, backbiting, afraid to come out of your tents to fight a battle for God. Then just stay. That's what God let them do. Uh, again, Kadesh Barnier, one day too late. It can be a holy place, and it can be a desert of warning, wandering rather, but it can, and a warning also, don't, don't be a wimp. Don't wait one day too late. Love God coming out the gate. He takes care of us. 
He puts his arms around us. He puts his wing over us. He protects us. He is our wall. As, as you will read in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the final battle of Armageddon and even Haman Gog, that God is the wall between us and the enemy. Stand behind him and know you will always be protected doing what's right, but be willing also to be a doer, not a tent pole hugger. Okay. You know, you keep hugging a tent pole, afraid to go out, a tent's pretty flimsy protection. Okay. It will not protect you from the enemy. You have to be willing to be with God, stand up, do what is right. Our Father always takes care of His own. So those little ones that were His children, they're going to inherit that land. Verse 40, But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Okay. It's going to happen. So uh, And so it was. Uh, Moses relaying all this, laying it out as to how it was. And so it was. Verse 41, And then you answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye had girded on every man his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the hill. There's just one big problem, my friend. God's already withdrawn from them. And you go to war without God, and you're in a heap of hurt. Verse 42, And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. In other words, you're going to lose. Uh, and, and so it is. You either have God with you, I don't know, do you have him in your life today? It's important that you do if you want to be a winner. He takes care of his own. But you can wait one day too late also. Don't let that happen to you. We're not at that time yet, but that time will come when it will be one day too late. And when these finally got around to deciding, oh, we're going to take them, they're going to they're get thumped real good because God is not with them. You must always do it God's way. That's important. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. You, you have the right to discern who you fellowship with, but you don't judge. We have one judge, that's our Father, okay? And you that listen by short wave, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always, always a pleasure to hear from you. Now, got a prayer request? You can do away with that number. You can do away with the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He's a heart knower. You can talk to him anytime you want to, and he hears you. The thing you want to always do in your prayer 
When you need something, study His promises and claim them. Okay. God Himself has stated in the great book of Isaiah, you know, remind me of the promises I've made to you so I can justify you, so I can do right by you. But you've got to claim it. Okay. And that should be a great part of your prayer. So think about it. Father, around the globe, we, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We have called up Phil from Wisconsin in the last broadcast. Here goes Phil's question. Pastor Murray, what do you think about the Gnostic Gospels that were discovered in Egypt in 1945, specifically the Gospels of Thomas, Philip, Mary Magdalena, the Gospel of Truth? Why were these Gospels not included in the New? Because they're, they're very questionable, okay? And you should treat them so, all right? Do not treat them as, um, uh, as gospel. It doesn't hurt. Once you know the truth, it doesn't hurt to read them. Okay. But anything that is different other than is written in these words, that's the name of Deuteronomy, these words, then it's a fake. Okay. Uh, Dave from Maryland. How long did the rich man have to suffer? What kind of suffering was it? And I'm not totally understanding it. Can you make it clear? Thank you. Well, he was very much alive, wasn't he? That's obvious because he felt pain. It was disappointment. Have you ever been so disappointed and, and um, angry at yourself that you could just feel the heat? Okay. I mean, here he was. I mean, he's a rich man. He's always had everything to his taste, his will. And he ends up in Gehenna, which is that part of paradise that's on the wrong side of the Gulf. He can see, he can see poor old Lazarus over with Abraham, meaning no one's dead. They're all with God. But here he has to suffer that fate until the millennium. And then we'll see while he's in that spiritual body, if he makes the same mistakes again, or if he can repent. Or, or have a little bit of a change. We'll see. Mark from Kentucky. My wife left due to adultery. If I get remarried, am I a sinner? Well, you know, I believe and I teach that Christ can forgive all sins except one, and, and adultery is not that sin. Adultery is not the unpardonable sin. So if, if you repent of any part you might have had in that, uh, her having left you, then um, by all means, uh, go in peace. Eddie from Colorado. Pastor Murray, I watch your program every day. I tried to help a couple of guys who were down on their luck, and it backfired on me. I am just not sure what to do. I hope God is not mad at me because I tried my best to help them. Well, I, I'm sure that, you know, you're not supposed to cast your pearls before swine. Okay. You, you need to be, you need to spiritually discern a little better than that. And you see, God is maybe a little disappointed that you didn't have better judgment than that or discerning, but he's not angry at you. You tried your best. But again, I'm going to say, there are some people that you cannot help, especially when you read Romans chapter 11, and you see that God himself sent the spirit of slumber on some, there's nothing you can do about it. I will give you some advice. Before you help anyone to any large extent, you plant one seed, and if that seed doesn't grow, it's over. Okay. You don't need to go past that. If that one seed doesn't grow, you see, because only God can make that seed grow, it means they're not interested. Okay. And there's better, better harvest down the road than, than uh, creeps, okay? Janet from Washington. When Jesus comes down to reign with us for a thousand years and then he says he will loose the devil for a thousand years, whoop, that's not true, okay? Does that mean that Satan will be with us again? Also, can you explain the unpardonable sin? Uh, if you'll read Revelation chapter 20, you will see that at the end of the thousand year reign of teaching with Christ that Satan is only released for a short season.
That's just a very short period. It certainly will not extend or past five months. I don't think it will be that long. And uh, then comes the judgment, the great white throne judgment. Not certainly a thousand years. Satan will only have a short season. Read again Revelation chapter 20. The unpardonable sin is as it is written in Luke chapter 12 verse 10, when you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, if you refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you as it is written in Mark chapter 13. Linda from Tennessee, I have been told by people that we are destined when we are born to either go to heaven or hell. What do you think about that? Well, it's a lie. That's what I think about it. Why? Because it, it, it absolutely is. You are not judged on empty space, and that's what that would be. You are judged on your actions, on your decisions, on your works, and on your faith, what you do. If you are a hearer and a doer, you're in good shape. I'll say that again. If you are a hearer and a doer, you're in good shape. Otherwise, uh, but, but God only judges people for what they do. If what you're saying were true, and it isn't, if God knew before this second earth age exactly what everyone would do, born innocent of woman, to make his or her own mind up what they would do, then he would not have brought the second earth age into being. It would have been a waste of time because he would have already known. But you see, when God gives someone uh, free will to love him or love Satan, it is the entity, Linda, that must make his or her mind up which they're going to love, and then they're judged by that. Uh, Shirley from Texas, um, I've been raised in a church that teaches rapture theory. How do I now explain to my children now that it is not true? Well, if know what you're doing. If, if nothing else, order my tape on rapture doctrine, true or false, okay? And fortify yourself whereby you know from God's word how to document that it's not true. And then lead and guide and help your children, okay? Uh, Sammy from Tennessee. Is it a sin for parents to try to control their grown children? My father believes that because he is the parent that somewhere in the Bible it states that he is, has the right to forever control us, no matter how old we get. This is based on the fact that he is the same age to us as he was the day we were born. This makes no sense to me. Well, it doesn't to God either. And apparently he's never read Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. I'm going to repeat that again. Apparently, he's never read Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. What does it say? It says, when one marries, you must separate yourself from your mother and father and become one flesh with your mate. Okay. In other words, you begin another family, and uh, it is blocked out as far as that is concerned. An elder must earn respect. And an elder that is not respected is an elder, elder probably that doesn't deserve respect. But respect is love uh, for a parent, and we always love our parents, okay? Bruce from, um, um, I, I don't know what state that is, so I'll just say Bellingham, okay? Thank you for your teachings and service. The question I have is, I have a problem with when I study and read with you the Bible, the wonderful truth, is it sounds like it is written for Israelites and his chosen people only. No, 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 no. And everyone else is a second class citizen. That's not true. Whomsoever will. And, and besides, many are Israelites that don't know, realize they are. God didn't lose them, but they lost their own way because God said, I'm going to blind you. I'm going to scatter you to the world, the four winds. And so he did. But um, through Christ, it, Christ came through the tribe of Isaac, okay? Which is to say the seed of Isaac, I should say, better said. And in him all live or die, 
Okay. You either have him or you're, you're not going to make the eternity. I'm, I can report that with sound doctrine, okay? Uh, and you might say, well, can you prove that in the Bible? No, in real life. You just wait and see. The judgment's coming. You'll find out then. That's, that's the way you do it, okay? And uh, there, there is no other way. But it's written to whomsoever will. And through the Israelites came the Savior. And the Savior is for every race, color, and, tree, and creed, okay? Joanne from Missouri. My daughter just went through a divorce that, which she didn't want. The church we go to says she can't get remarried unless he commits adultery. Is this true? If not, can you tell me where to find this in the Bible so I can show her also that uh, they say to take the Lord's Supper up on the first day of the week, if this true. Now, as often as you meet, and they met three times a year, at Passover, Pentecost, and uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, you know, uh, I, Christ is a savior and a forgiver. How many times if somebody falls short are you supposed to give them? Seven times 70, that's 490 times, okay? And um, if, um, it would seem that she, um, her marriage certainly wasn't made in heaven or he would never have left her. And um, so I feel that when she repents, and many, many stand against me on this, but then they're not really Christians if they do because Christ forgives all sins but one, and that's the unpardonable sin, and it has nothing to do with adultery, Divorce, this divorce is not the unpardonable sin. If without repentance, it would be a sin for her to remarry. But if she repents for anything she might have done to cause the divorce, whether she did or didn't, and just forgive him and let him go, it's as though it never happened and she starts with a, a clean uh, slate in, in our father's eyes when he forgives her. She's forgiven. Um, many people not understanding the law of God's word can twist things up and put penalties on. Truth sets you free. It doesn't put you in bondage. Let her know that. Johnny from Georgia, I view the program of the teachings of God's word every day. God allows me. I have been more, I have learned more while studying with Shepherd's Chapel. Question, if no J's are in the Hebrew ABC, example, Jehovah. How, help me understand while we say in the name of Jesus. Well, because you're speaking in English, okay. If you were speaking in the Hebrew tongue, when you said Jehovah, you would say Yahweh. Yah, okay. Not Jah, Yah, okay. And if you were saying Jesus in the Hebrew tongue, you would say Yeshua, okay? Not Jesus, it's, there, it's, there is no J in that language. Paul from Georgia, I've been listening to your Bible study almost three years, I love the way that, thank you. Can you please explain 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18? Is this what others say is the rapture? And if not, what is this? Had this event happened already, and if not, when? Thank you so much for teaching about the Word. Well, it's the same event that you will find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, at the last trump. We're all changed into spiritual bodies. But you pick the subject up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, which simply says, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen, that if you believe Christ rose from the dead, and, and if you either do or you're not a Christian, then you better believe also that all those that are asleep or dead in him are with him. They've res resurrected also. So they're not out here in a hole in the ground. But we can't perceive them. Why? Because they're already gone. But then at the seventh trump, we will all change into spiritual bodies. Uh, Valerie from uh, Nevada. Uh, see, well, come, let's, let's see. Uh, so I went again, and this time the man teaching said, when you die, you go to heaven, and there is two sides 
the good and the bad, and that Satan can go from one side to the other. That is not true, okay? Uh, as he pleases, I don't believe God would allow this, but don't know where he got it from. I, I don't know where he got it from either. He may have got it from Job chapter 1, verse 6, but he's not allowed that privilege any longer because Michael's got him hogtied, okay? Um, you can, Jesus explained both sides of paradise in Luke chapter 16. So I recommend that you read Luke 16 real closely and you'll see both sides, but there's a gulf in between that no one can cross at this time. Millennium possibility there'll be some crossing. Right now, no one, not Satan or anyone, can cross that gulf. Uh, Deb from Pennsylvania, a question on tithing. Is it a tenth of each paycheck? I receive child support. Do I give a tenth of that? I get paid weekly. I want to tithe to Shepherd's Chapel. Help me to understand. Well, don't, don't tithe on your child support. That's not yours. That's your child's, okay? And you, you, don't, you don't tithe on that. That's, that is your... Um, monies to give that child what they need. Okay. Now, I can tell by this that you're probably a single parent and things are pretty close. So, um, when, when you can't give a full tenth, which at the time that the tithe was set, then it was the government. The church was the government. And that tithe took care of Social Security, the whole bit. All right? So, I would recommend that you have send a love offering. That's after your expenses are paid and so forth. But at the same time, you're the one that has to make your mind up if God has put a, uh, but don't tithe on the child's child support. That's his um, to sustain because of the trouble between he and you and the father, okay? And from California. Is there a verse that says God is not in control, but Satan is in control of the world at this time? No, there's not one that will say that. Now, uh, let, let me work with that just a little bit with you. God is definitely on the throne, and God is certainly in control. But he does allow Satan's evil spirit, just as he allows the Holy Spirit, his spirit, to traverse the earth. And he will take you under if you allow it. But you see, God gave us, in the name of Jesus, power and authority over Satan and all our enemies. So we don't have to put up with it. But if you put up with it, he's the prince of darkness, and uh, it's his hour. He will, he'll help you out a bunch, okay? But use, use your authority. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Kenny from New Jersey, a brother and I have been spinning the disc on a few questions we have concerning the Bible. We cannot receive tapes or CDs here in this prison, only liter literature and written correspondence. We were hoping that you could and would offer us insight on our unanswered questions. They are, is the Archangel Michael in Daniel 10, 13 actually Jesus? Absolutely not. You know, that's almost sacrilegious. You want to be real careful. I know where it comes from, but Michael is an archangel. Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, be real careful of that. Okay, um, what does Revelation 2014 mean? Well, it's the great white throne judgment. And when Satan is released a short season, at the end of the millennium, at the end of the thousand year period, then comes the white throne judgment. Um, does the word God in the Bible come from the Hebrew word Elohim? And what does Elohim mean? The word God comes from simply El, E-L in the Hebrew tongue, okay? Elohim is plural. It's God and his children, okay? Uh, Georgia from North Carolina. What will happen to the good people who were brought up in good homes 
but believe differently than we do. Um, and you're speaking of non-Christians. Well, they, they will either convert or in the millennium, they will have an opportunity to learn, okay? God never judges anyone that doesn't have a fair chance. And many would say, well, are you teaching their second chance? Uh-uh, not a second chance. If they didn't have a chance coming out the gate, God's not going to condemn them to hell when they didn't know any better, okay? Uh, Alan from Oklahoma. Realizing the Bible indicates we will be judged on our deeds, my question is, if we are forgiven for our sins, then what deeds will be, will be judged on are good ones? Uh, and just as important, are there different degrees or levels of rewards? Well, uh, you could assume there would be in as much as our rewards or righteous acts create the fine linen we wear as robes in heaven. You just, some won't have much robe, okay? Um, your deeds that are bad are sins. And if you repent for your sins, those deeds are erased. The good deeds are recorded, and on repentance, they still stay there. And that is your reward in that final judgment. All right, and we're out of time again. Hey, I love you all. I hope you're going to enjoy this book of Deuteronomy. It is the law given forth in the layperson's terms. I think you'll love it. I think you'll enjoy it. Most of all, God loves you for the fact you study chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Makes his day. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If, if we have helped you, then uh, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you know what? When you bless God, he will always, I do mean always, bless you. But there's one thing that's more important than anything else, and it's this, that you listen good now, you stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.